Welcome to Conservation Conversations, the podcast where we discuss emerging technologies, global trends, and the future of biodiversity conservation. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, where we leverage science and technology to protect endangered species and ecosystems around the world. So uh, welcome to Conservation Conversations with Sean O'Brien. Today marks the one year anniversary of Conservation Conversations. And I wanna take a moment and thank everyone for listening and for uh, sending your feedback and comments in. It's been really a great, great experience and a great year. Um, Over the past year, we've talked to some of the key influencers in science, agriculture, technology, and other fields about their unique work in conservation and the implications for the sixth extinction, which of course is a big thing that uh, NatureServe is involved in. Uh, trying to prevent. Um, We also talked a lot about climate change, uh, public health, worldwide food systems, and many, many other topics. Um, And we hope that by asking our guests to share their experiences and their knowledge, that you've been able to learn something and also been inspired to seek out opportunities to be involved in uh, working on conservation in your daily life. Uh, You are a key part of the puzzle in the conservation of biodiversity. Uh, if you've enjoyed listening to the podcast and want to support NatureServe, please consider donating at www.natureserve.org slash donate. And I uh, would be happy to uh, talk to anybody about that also if they want more information. And we're excited to uh, launch this new season with um, an acclaimed wildlife uh, biologist and author, Doug Chadwick. Doug, um, I like to think of uh, him starting his career living not unlike a mountain goat when he was doing research on mountain goat ecology and their social behavior in the Rockies. Um, And he's also done research on things like harlequin ducks, wolverines, grizzly bears, and whales. He's uh, helped produce or written 14 books and hundreds of magazine articles, including several featured in National Geographic um, on things like snow leopards, uh, lowland rainforests, and coral reefs. Um, and Doug is on the board of the Liz Claiborne and Art Artenberg Foundation, which supports wildlife research and community-based conservation programs throughout the world, which is also awesome. So, Doug, thank you for all that you do, and um, thank you for being on Conservation Conversations. Oh, well, thanks for a nice introduction. I'll, yeah. I'll try to live up to some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you will. I know you will. Um, so, you know, one of the things I like to start with. Um, is to ask people, like, you've dedicated your life to thinking about biology and specifically, in many ways, how to communicate that information to a broader audience. And I was just curious, like, what, what happened early in your life to inspire you? And I have some insight into that from reading the book, but I'd like to have you tell the audience that. Sure. Um, yeah, when I was... <laughs> seven or eight, my father, who was a field geologist, gave me his microscope that he'd used for mineralogy, and I turned it on. And I started looking at dust bunnies I gathered under the couch and, you know, scabs I picked off my knee and ditch water near our home and a pinch of soil. And the world came alive in a totally unexpected way. And I, so I, I had this bipolar youth where I, I was out playing baseball and beating up little kids and, you know, doing everything kids <laughs> do, um, blowing stuff up. Uh, and then I turned into a geek uh, microbiologist, just out of sheer wonder. I didn't picture myself that way. I just couldn't stay away from this thing. And, and that led on to uh, my going into wildlife biology because I fascinated by critters of all sizes and at one point and I didn't write about this in the book so much um, but I, I was studying those mountain goats you mentioned and they were my world uh, I was just camped out on a mountainside for months at a time and then I watched uh, new logging road go in um, there was unlimited hunting of mountain goats at the time. They didn't know anything about mountain goats. There was unlimited hunting of grizzly bears. They didn't know very much about grizzly bears. And I was just watching the the biodiversity of that wonderful mountainside, which was 
essentially wild and and next to the Bob Marshall wilderness, uh, I just watched it uh, dwindle and I got really ticked off. And by that, I don't mean I turned into a raging, uh, a fire breathing enviro. It, it was that I'd been going to scientific symposia and looking at a career in wildlife biology. And I decided that wasn't going to be enough. I needed to communicate what was going on. This was public land. These were the people's resources and animals people very, you know, um, attracted to. And they had no idea. And this was going on everywhere in the Rockies. So that that's, I hope that's a reasonable answer. I, I was motivated by not quite outrage, but um, I saw a great need to get the word out. Yeah, no, that that is great. And it, I think it leads you in many ways directly many years later to your book, Four Fifths of Grizzly, which is uh, just came out on audiobook and is also in print now and available to order. Um, and it is very much uh, communicating that outrage that you have, but also <laughs> um, a very scientific book. I mean, in, in, in there's a lot of really deep scientific knowledge incorporated into the book, but in a very approachable way, and the sort of science communications aspect of it, as well as the conservation communication part, I think is really powerful. Well, I, I was the hardest book I ever wrote. Um, and you would know, Sean, uh, that communicating the biodiversity, communicating how nature works at the molecular level, at the genetic level, um, are you going to, are people still going to be reading it when, you know, you're two pages into a, a, a analysis of what's going on? So it's easy. I, I've got a lifetime of National Geographic stories where there I was surrounded by superlatives. You know, I'm trying to push it. At one point, I was trying to push a 80 ton right whale off my head so I could get to the surface. I was <laughs> snorkeling to look at them. Uh, you know, it's tales like that, you know, uh, all, all the charging rhinos and gorilla encounters and stuff. Great. I had a lot of fun. I learned a ton, but it was pretty obvious and you'd know better than most people. Um, I don't have time to just keep focusing on single species and single areas that need more public awareness. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it took me a while to get there, but I realized I, I, I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to talk about the nature in us and the nature of nature. And it was a real challenge, but that's what we're supposed to be doing is pushing ourselves into uh, uncomfortable levels of uh, yeah. effort. One of the things that I think is really great about the timing of when it came out is the things that we've learned in just the past few years about this interconnectedness that you talk about yeah. and how mycorrhizae work and the, whether or not it's a true symbiosis, but sort of the symbiotic relationships between the way things are organized. Um you know, your your section on lichens is short, but I wanted it to be longer because I find them so fascinating <laughs> and we don't really think yeah. that much about yeah. them, but they're an example of the interconnectedness. And I just like, and also uh, I learned way more about strawberries than I ever thought I would. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Everything you wanted to know and a whole lot more, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks for that. Uh, because that, that opens up the a chance to talk about you you work full time trying to preserve the integrity of our ecosystems, the biodiversity, the splendor, and the potential of the living world around us. And I I would like to try to expand the concept of biodiversity to us. We are also lichens in a sense. We have symbiotic relationships with trillions of bacteria. If you ground me up in a, a well, we won't, we won't go into, you yeah. just, grind, just grind me up, put me, put me under a mass spectrometer and, and 98 to 99% of the DNA in me is microbial. It's all those bacteria in there helping me digest and fight off infections producing hormones that are similar to ones we produce and probably influencing my moods and therefore my thoughts. Yeah. Um, and you would get the DNA from the 
the little organelles called mitochondria that are in every human cell and every plant cell and every protist cell, uh, except for bacteria and archaea. And they're powering everything we do. So you take away our partners, our, our the other members of our joint venture, we call a human being, and we're dead. And, and so I, I, how does this translate? When I'm in the Serengeti, for example, I'm looking at that wonderful splendor of the biomass out there of, of zebra and wildebeest and gazelles and elephants and giraffes. And I'm wondering, how does this ecosystem support it? And then I start looking down at the level of termites and I look at the microflora in their gut, which is what actually digests the wood and transforms it into organic material that supports the regenerative abilities of that ecosystem. And then I find out uh, in, in probing through these scientific journals that the digestive enzymes are actually produced by bacteria living on the cell walls of the protozoans <laughs> inside the gut of the termite that recycles a great part of... Look, the termites and ants in East Africa outweigh all those big, beautiful, charismatic critters mm -hmm, right. tromping across the plain. And it's all that connectedness. And then I look inside myself and say, well, it's the same thing. We're discovering so much so quickly and yet we're losing so much so quickly. It's just like, you know, burning the books in the library and or throwing away the the, the grand artworks of the world. I mean, we, we're just, uh, what can I say? I, I'm, I'm talking to you, you know, you can, you could probably say this better and at yeah. greater length. But. No, actually, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you today was because one of the most important things I think that we can do as organizations that are working to conserve biodiversity is do a better job of science communications, of translating the work that we do to everyone to be able to understand. It's not that it's so, well, it is actually complicated, but it's all fields are complicated in one way or another. It's just yeah. that traditionally we haven't done necessarily the best job of describing it in such a way. And one of the things that's so great in Four Fifths of Grizzly um, is that you and Patagonia did a fantastic job of illustrating this beautiful book and it they really brings some everything. of the things yeah. to life in a way that you don't get from a textbook or you don't get in, in other formats and yeah. um so the science communications part is something that we're working on here in conservation conversations and also with the uh, the van humboldt tour that we were mentioning earlier right well i'm glad uh, yeah I, I was gonna ask you about that because uh, how do you how do you bridge that gap between how scientists speak to one another and how those of us who want to conserve the living world in a splendor, um, how do we communicate? How do we translate that to the American public, to the world public? So what do you, give me some tips. I, I, I did my best in that book, but. <laughs> well, I, actually, that's one of the great things about the book is you have these, as you mentioned earlier, these adventures that give you sort of a, a window or a, a hook to hang a story on. And I think that's a really key part of doing this is, so for instance, um, as part of what I'm doing here for NatureServe, I'm traveling to the natural heritage programs in the states and provinces in the United States and Canada that do the research on the uh, threatened and endangered species across our continent and seeing them in their native habitat and talking to the scientists who do the work on them and, and experiencing their passion for these plants and animals and insects and yeah. mussels and other, other creatures and trying to translate the sort of emotion of being on the ground that you've talked about into uh, information that can be used for people to think about how they're, how they fit into conservation as well. And it, we want to make sure that, you know, every, every field has its jargon and some of that jargon is really important to use. And you do a nice job in the book of defining things and calling things out so that people can use the right terminology to uh, describe things. Yeah. And I think that's a really important part, right? Don't, don't to oversimplify it because by oversimplifying it, you're killing so much of the story. 
Yeah, and you're also talking down to people. You know, you just it's it's it, let's say it was a new territory for me. A lot easier to tell stories. But <laughs> look, the title Four Fifths of Grizzly is intended to play into you know the section where I say who are the big questions in life of who are we and where do we come from and biodiversity is itself a, one of those big intimidating words to a lot of people and it's mm -hmm. very hard to do i you know uh hard to define to in the real world everyday context and four-fifths of grizzly is meant to say by the way if grizzlies are a threatened species and we're trying to protect them and and it looks like a, a pretty hard job because they demand large connected wildlands and a lot more tolerance on our part um but by the way, you're at least 80% grizzly bear genetically. You share that many genes with them. And I was talking to a group last night in, in Whitefish on the shores of the lake. It was very nice. We're all well fed. Everyone's drinking wine. I was able to say, oh, and by the way, uh, that dog that just ran by shares um, 85, 84% of your genes. The fish out there in the lake, 60%. And you're also 24% a wine grape. Um, and some of those people were a little bit more than that last night, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you're 7% of bacterium that genetically we, we all life shares these common traits and that makes us incredibly biodiverse. That's all our kin. Mm -hmm. And I take it personally when we tell people we stand to lose what a third to up to a half of the species on the planet. I mean, right. what do you, so that, yeah, um, that's us. You mentioned in uh, the sixth extinction in the book, and we've talked about it on this uh, podcast before, but I'm always trying to uh, come up with a really concise way to talk about what is the sixth extinction and what does that mean? And so I'd like to hear yeah. your, you know, what's your quick take on that? Well, I'd say it, it comes back to looking at the rest of the living world as as our greater selves. I think, I think people, when you say, look, there's a lot of animal and plant in you, you share uh, your makeup with all these, and they affect you. Um, and it isn't just a list of species and oh gosh, the list got a little shorter and we lost a lot of obscure critters that I never heard about before and nothing changed uh, in my life. It's like, well, you lost a lot of potential for everything from medical cures to structural capabilities we might want to make use of. It's that old save that wildflower because it make your cancer argument, which actually turns out to be true. Um, but on top of that, it's, as you know, you're losing the, the diversity and stability of the systems that support us. And we are at a pretty ignorant stage given the rate at which we're discovering stuff through molecular biology and, and other new scientific technology, we're at a very rudimentary stage of understanding how all this works. Mm -hmm. It's like understanding how our own microbiome affects us. Right. And doc and doctors are starting to recommend to people, you know, that you change your diet instead of giving you another pill, that you spend more time outdoors because there's been study after study showing that contact with nature um increases longevity and human health. Yeah. It lowers your heart rate, does all these, you know, boosts your immune system. We don't understand all the ins and outs. We just know we evolved in wild, diverse settings for 300 to 350,000 years as homo sapiens. Yeah. So. The, uh, the interconnectedness, uh, I think, is really interesting. Um, you know, we... We don't know if this wildflower is going to cure cancer, but also does it matter if it doesn't, right? Yeah. So from the yeah. perspective yeah. of the moral or the aesthetic value of and the interconnectedness, we just don't know. And so do we have the right to cause a species to go extinct? Right. You know, I've, I've recently been in the field with a number of biologists um and in the presence of these highly endangered species and when you see them on the ground you think okay well there's very few of these and they're in this small area 
could I make the argument, well, if it went extinct, so what? It's just a couple of plants yeah. in this area. But we don't know, yeah. right? A, we don't know what impact that could have. And B, this is something that spent millions of years evolving to this place. And because yeah. of the impact of climate change and habitat fragmentation and pollution and things like that that humans are causing, now this species is going to disappear. Right. And every, I, I take the attitude that every creature alive today from the microscopic to the great whales is a right answer to the question of how best to live on this planet. And it's certainly the best answer to how best to live in this ecosystem or that environment. And we now have the tools to draw from all those animals, that kind of information yeah. based on their genetic abilities, their behavior, all the other things that come with every single species, large or small. And yes, yeah, so I, I think we're, we're both agreeing. We, we're just discovering the value of a lot of these so-called obscure species, the kind people think oh, only a few entomologists, uh, a few geeks in the, in the ivory tower worry about these kinds of things. It's like, no, we, we're not bright enough. We're not knowledgeable enough to say, oh, well, we, you know, we're not going to miss them much. We yeah. don't know enough. Yeah. And so I think we're on the same wavelength, uh, but I, I want to know how you, how you met. Do you think the last year, I, here in Montana, we noticed everywhere you go out to be in contact with nature, or just go wildlife watching or take a good hike, the people everywhere. Uh, the COVID pandemic seems to have sent all kinds of people outdoors. Um, and maybe just, you know, because there aren't a lot of other people out there um, just for safety, but also as, um, you know, a mental a break from from. Uh, being restricted in all the things we're doing. And I wondered how, you know, I wonder how you guys kept going during all that, but I also wonder if you notice a change in people's um, openness to nature. Yeah. So in terms of how we kept going, part of the answer to that is most of our scientists at NatureServe and in our broader network have so much data that they uh, haven't had time to analyze. So some of them were able to hunker down and do some analyses that they were okay, yeah, wanting yeah. to do for a while because they were uh, not getting out. But then once we realized that going outside and being outside was one of the safer things that we could do, um, people started doing their field work again and going on hikes. And we saw these amazing increases in the number of people using our parks. And so there's this sort of tension of yeah. some parks weren't designed for that level of use. And so it's potentially damaging. Yeah. But the most important thing is for people to be connected to nature. And if you're going to have more parks and you're going to have conservation, people need that connection. And so we yeah. need people out doing that. And then you have a constituency and you have people you talking to their elected officials and to their, their local government saying, we need more parks. We need more trails. We need more of this. So it's, um, I think it's, the, there's a lot of uh, public land. There's a lot of park land. Um, people tend to go to very specific ones because they're close by or they're more famous. Um, yeah. And so we need to maybe see what we can do to encourage people to go to some of the more remote or more obscure places um, in a yeah. in a sustainable way. Uh, but yeah, the more people going outside and enjoying nature and forest bathing or yeah. whatever, uh, yeah. the better. Yeah, for sure. Well. I'm so glad to hear you say it because we're here in Montana, we're flooded with visitors and it's great. They do own the land. That's one of the great things about the U S and Canada is we have uh, huge amounts of, of land that is owned by every citizen. Um, and many as spectacular and full of animals as some of our national parks. And, and what we're, concentrating on is micromanaging ever increasing numbers of people in the same darn parks. Right. And you just said, why aren't we saying make more parks, make more, make more, if not parks, then a multiple use area, but that emphasizes wildlife. Right. And that gets us to what's missing in our conservation strategy, at least here. I, I look at the world through the lens of the Rockies because it's where I live, but we've got this string of, 
gems like a necklace uh, from Canada down into the U.S. Right. Banff and Jasper and and uh, Waterton Lakes and Glacier and Yellowstone on and on. Um, we know most extinctions have taken place on islands uh, historically. Um, and I, we won't have time to get into the reasons, but they're small and vulnerable. And they and the residents, the wild residents, don't have any place to go if conditions change. So what when I look at this string of parks we have, and America's got a great park system, but it's it looks like, to me, an archipelago of islands. Mm-hmm. And when they were made there was a lot of de facto wildland between them. The animals could still move and exchange genes and adapt to changing conditions. And now they're increasingly isolated. They're stuck on those islands. Mm -hmm. And if we want to maintain biodiversity, the one of the most important things we can do is start making wild waves, corridors, habitat bridges, whatever, to connect those existing refuges. Then we can finally pat ourselves on the back and say, we're saving nature. Right. Right now we're working on a century old model and it worked at the time. It was, thank goodness for all those heroes that that worked so hard to make our parks and preserves, but now we need to connect them. And that will do more for biodiversity than anything I can think of. We're super fortunate to have had some of these people in uh, in the history that created these parks. Um, last month, we had Michelle Nyhouse on talking about her book, Beloved Beasts, which was a lot of that sort of history of how we got to where yeah. we are now. And you're right, like uh, the corridors and the interconnectedness. Um, and it's a great segue to the Why to Why project that you, you're excited about yeah. and involved in. So give us a little Dude, bit about yeah. that. Sure. 2,000 miles from south of Yellowstone a bit into the Wind River Range up to the headwaters of the Peel River and the Yukon. And it was really driven by grizzly bears um, asking the question of over time, genetically, to avoid inbreeding and ensure survive, long-term survival if we we're really going to recover grizzlies. What size landscape would they need to be operating in they certainly didn't arise in something the size of glacier park right. you know small you know relatively look a grizzly can walk from one side of the park to the other in a day mm-hmm. and they have very large home ranges and and so they and there was a, the other reason grizzlies drove this is people pay a lot of attention to them for the mostly because you know, they might eat me, but, but all, they're, they're very charismatic. They're very much like us and they're omnivores and so on and so forth. So I said, they told us that we're not protecting nature on a large enough scale. And the grizzly makes a great umbrella species as does the snow leopard in Asia or the elephant in Africa. It tells you how big a scale you need to be operating on to maintain these big animals and if it's good enough for them it'll carry most of the rest of the fauna and flora into the future along with them so that's what yellowstone to yukon does and they've had a lot of um uh, pushback of course because people say oh it's a super park or oh it's going to put everybody out of work it turns out that tourism and recreation are driving the economies in a large part of the yellowstone to yukon eco region Mm-hmm. Saving wildlife is synonymous with creating jobs and making people money in the communities in that region. What's not to like? Yeah. Um, and they increase connectivity in this 2,000 mile stretch from less than 5% to more than 30% since they started in 1992. So this is big deal and it's a global model. Yeah, it's great progress. Thanks for the oppor- thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. You yeah, know, get course. involved. Look at look it up on the website. I mean, if uh, I'm talking to your audience, just uh, you know, check them out. What's the, What's program. their website? Go ahead, and say it. Is it? Uh, it is y to y dot net. Y to y. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, that'll work. Great. Well, um, Doug, is there anything else you wanted to add um, before we sign off? Oh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I know that's a, that was <laughs> a wide open hour? question, of course. Yeah, that certainly <laughs> was. Um, no, I, I think I'll, I'll thank you for your time and 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 for your good words about the book. I I 
do credit Patagonia with doing a marvelous job of it and uh, of illustrating it, of designing it. There are graphics in there that tell the story. You didn't come right out earlier and say, well, a picture actually is worth a thousand words, but it, it makes the book that much bigger and clearer. And it was a tough job to get it across. So I want to credit them. And um, I want to thank you for the work that, that, you are doing as a resource for scientists and laymen all over the place. I mean, this is badly needed and you and I will be carrying on the, the task of trying to f convey biodiversity and the need to protect it, to stop what is clearly a, a major extinction crisis on the planet. Yeah. I don't want to live in a world without a lot of these creatures. I and completely I, agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's it's a personal, as a scientist, you say it's foolish not to live in a world with protecting all these creatures, and just leave it at that. Um, mm -hmm. I would urge everyone to go make a little neighborhood green space. You know, we all ask, you know, you read all these terrible statistics, and you say, what can one person out of 8 billion now um, do? And you say, go make a little neighborhood park. Go work in your garden, plant stuff on your windowsill. You'll benefit. And the neighborhood, make it so the neighborhood can get a little bit more of this. Join a land trust that protects remaining open spaces, pays people to keep them open, doesn't claim their land or regulate them. Uh, it just prevents the development of it at a certain level. Yeah. And then go out and, as you say, make more parks, make more, make more areas for everyone to get that contact with nature and, and keep their eyes open, their ears open. And I think, I think we'll get more people supporting biological diversity conservation. Great. And, and thanks for uh, the nice things you said about NatureServe um, and want to uh, recommend to the audience again that uh, Four Fifths of Grizzly is a, a good read and um, as as we were talking, the illustrations really do add a lot and tell a lot of story and bring home some of the information in a really nice way. And so I want to thank you, Doug, for you know bringing this information to the lay audience in such a, a beautiful and compelling way. And I look forward to uh, coming to visit you in Montana and uh, going out into one of these uh, natural areas together. I got some mountain goats and wolverines that I'd like to introduce you to. So come on out. And thank you for the opportunity, Sean. It's been great. Absolutely. Great. Well, uh, thanks. This has been Conservation Conversations with Sean O'Brien. And we've been on with uh, Doug Chadwick, the author of Four Fifths of Grizzly, and many other books and uh, interesting articles about uh, nature and wildlife and adventures in the wilds. And uh, thank you for listening.